Okay. Sorry. I wasn't. Okay, let's start. I'm going to start again. So we're going to, um, in today's lab, we are going to demonstrate three different methods. Uh, we're going to talk about how to compute descriptive statistics, how to find the five number summary, and how to f build a box plot. The data set like, uh, is available on Blackboard. So it's the same data that we used last week, the eight variable home data. Do you remember where that is? Yeah, try, we'll try, I'm gonna try and be very consistent from lab to lab and always use the same data. Okay, so this is again our eight variable home data. And sorry, I just have to mention again, cause I wasn't, um, I didn't start the recording before. So the lab quiz opens on Monday the 28th at 8 p.m. and it closes on Tuesday the 29th at 8 p.m. You have in that 24 hour period, you can start and finish the quiz. It just has to be submitted by 8 p.m. on the 29th. Okay. Oh, and that quiz is on modules one and two. The work from modules one and two is what we covered on the first assignment and what we talked about last week in lab. Okay, so nothing from today should appear on that quiz. All right, uh, so this work is for a, the next assignment in lecture, which would be the module three assignment. Oh, okay, so we have our eight variable lab data set. 88 observations and eight variables attached to it. If we want to find, for example, the mean, the median, um, the percentiles, and um, form a five number summary for the data set, we can do that by going in our commander to statistics, summaries, numerical summaries. Okay, so statistics, summaries, numerical summaries. We click that. Now, we're going to select a variable to measure. Notice that for the numerical summaries, um, sorry, Nicole, will it be a pretty similar format? Um, I will get back to you. I, I'll get an answer to that question by the end of today's section. I'm not... I would assume that they are quite similar, but I'm not entirely sure, but I will, I'll verify. Yeah, sorry. Um, <clears throat> okay, so again, what we're learning how to do right now is find um, summary statistics. So the mean, the median, standard deviation, certain percentiles for the quantitative values in our data set. Again, what I have done here is I have clicked statistics, summaries, numerical summaries. Now what I have to do is click a variable, very similar to what we did when we built histograms. Notice that the variables that are shown here are only for the quantitative values. Okay, so we have age, area, bath, price, size, and stories. So let's use area as our illustrative um, variable, okay? Now, we select area, make sure it's highlighted. Some, there was a few issues last week just with going to build graphs and whatnot and not highlighting the correct variable. We have to select one of the vari variables from the list or we will get an area. So let's try area um, inside the selection box for our variable. Then we can click the statistics tab. Notice that the statistics tab gives us flexibility and the information we would like to find. For example, we have the mean checked. We can also compute standard error of the mean, which we haven't talked about yet. We have standard deviation checked and we have the interquartile range checked. Okay, so these are the three are three of the statistics that we will have learned about in lecture, and I will discuss a little bit with you today, but you'll see them this week. We also have the quantile box checked, and we have 0, 0 0.25, 0 0.5, 0 0.75, and 1. Those are the five number, the values rather, that make up the five number summary. 
Okay, so by default, our commander gives us mean, standard deviation, interquartile range, and the five number summary. Okay, so we're all set. We actually don't even have to change anything. We just go data, select a variable, and click OK. Now you'll see here, my information has popped up inside the output box. Okay, let's talk a little bit about this information. We have mean first. So this is saying that the average area in the eight variable data set is 11,772.84 um whatever the units are squared okay the standard deviation let me just check what the units are actually yeah, it doesn't matter let's assume that it's um i don't know Square foot, that's usually what area is. Okay, so the, the mean for the eight variable data set is the, is 11,772.84 square feet. All right. The standard deviation is 2,711.071 square feet. The standard deviation, as a reminder, is telling us how far the observations um, vary with respect to the mean. So what we are saying here is that there is um, approximately a, well, with respect to the mean, the houses in our data set vary by roughly 2,700 square feet. Okay, so we have houses ranging from, is there a way to, um, sorry, I'm just actually checking. Oh, sick, okay. So what we're saying here is that the houses in our data set, or roughly 68% of the houses in our data set, are between 9,061.769 square feet and 9,061.769. Um, 14,483.91 square feet. So the standard deviation is basically giving us an idea of the square footage of the houses and how far they um, move from the mean. So we have in this particular data set, a standard deviation of 2,700 square feet, which is saying that we're observing houses that are between about 9,061.769 square feet and 14,483.91 square feet. Okay, so it's quite a bit of variation in the sizes of the house, houses. So in the data set, we have houses that are, you know, roughly 9,050 square feet, all the way up to houses that are almost 15,000 square feet. So the standard deviation is just giving us an idea of the differences in the square footage with the mean being placed at the center of the data set. Okay. Now in lecture, you should see um, the formula for how to uh, compute this value. I think that I might be able to show this formula to you. Um, yeah, if you just give me a second, I'll just pull it up for clarity. Okay, so we would have set two. Okay, 
So what we have done or talked about so far are the sample mean, which is this formula here. So the, the sample mean is simply that all of the values in the, in the area column added together divided by the total number of houses, which is 88. So this is what the average is. This is what we computed. And then the sample standard deviation is the formula given here in equation three. So that is the square root of the sum of the differences around the mean squared over n minus one. So this is the value that we computed for price that is in the second spot of our numerical summary. And again, what this is telling us is how far the values, um, how far away the values are from the mean. So it's giving us a sense of the um, range or the, um, I'm trying to think of another word for deviation, kind of the spread of the values in our data set with respect to the mean. Okay. Oh, sorry. No, oh, hope that doesn't cause any. All right, um, does anyone have any questions about those first two values, the mean and the standard deviation? Okay, in our numerical summary, the next value is the IQR. The IQR is the 75th percentile minus the 25th percentile. So you can see that the next five values in our summary have 0%, 25%, 50%, 75%, 100%. 100%. What that is telling us is that the IQR, for example, is the 75th percentile which is 12,750.7 minus the 25th percentile, which is 9,930.4. Okay, so if we type this into R, we get 2,820.3, right, which is the value given here. So the IQR is the value for the 75% marker minus the value for the 25% marker. Now the other three values in the five number summary, which are 0%, this is the minimum, okay? So the minimum value, the minimum area in the data set is 9,496.6. The 50% marker is the median, okay? So 50% marker, second quartile, median. Those are the same things. So the median value is 10,483.25. And then the maximum value, which is the 100%, is 20,748. Okay, so a small fortress. Now, we can compare the mean and the median to make a statement about the shape. Since those values appear to be quite close in, um, value, that is, we have 11,772.84 compared to 10,483.25. Those two values are um, fairly close. So we have minus, okay. So a difference of 900, well, almost 930 square feet. So the mean is larger than the median by roughly 930 square feet. Because the mean is bigger than the median, this implies some right skewness in the data set. Now, if we wanted to, what we could do here to verify this is go graphs, histogram, area, okay. Oh, and you can see actually that the, that right skewness is quite intense for the area, right? And again, what we're able to do is by comparing the mean to the median, since the mean is much larger than the median, that implies right skewness. If the mean and the median were about the same, 
that would imply symmetry. And if the mean was much smaller than the median, that would imply left skewness. Okay, so we can make statements about the shape based off of those values. All right, so from um, statistics summaries, numerical summaries, we are able to get the mean, the standard deviation, and the five number summary, where the five number summary are the, is comprised of the 0, 25th, 50th, and 75th, and 100th percentiles. 0 and 100% are the minimum and the maximum. 25% is Q1, the first quartile of the data. 50% is Q2, the second quartile of the data, and which is also the median. And 75% is Q3, which is the third quartile of the data. So these five numbers here make up the five number summary. This is kind of a weird follow-up question. Rebecca, say what again? The thing about skewness? Oh, yeah. I'll also cover this this afternoon in lecture, just FYI. But the, um, what I was saying is the mean and the median, I'll just go over it again quick because I already started. The mean and the median are, um, they have a, 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 a relationship to one another that actually defines the shape. So when the mean and the median are equal, we have symmetry. When the mean, is bigger than the median, we have right skewness, which is the case here. So you can notice that when we take the mean, 11,772.84, and we subtract the median, 10,483.25, it's clear that the mean, it, it, well, it produces a positive number. So it's clear that the mean is bigger than the median, which implies right skewness, which we can show through the graph that I have lost. Right, yeah. right. So the mean is bigger than the median, implies right skewness, and we can see that that's actually the case when we build the histogram. This is clearly a right skewed unimodal shape. When the mean is less than the median, we have left skewness. Okay. All right. Uh, okay, so the last thing that we have to learn is how to build a box plot. Okay. Um, well, we know that building plots using R commander is actually very easy. Of course, we're going to click graphs. Then we're going to click a box plot. Okay, what the box plot shows us is a visual representation of the five number summary. So if we click area, what we will be able to see are the five numbers, 0%, 25%, 50%, 75%, and 100% on a visual display, okay? If we go to options, we have our usual um, checks. You'll notice here that we have identify outliers. I'm gonna talk about this once we look at the plot. We're gonna leave this as automatic and then we can edit our plot labels accordingly. If we want to, we can also plot by groups so we can split the data based off of you know, houses with or without a pool and that sort of thing. Okay, all right, here's our box plot. Okay, so this is kind of a disaster of a box plot. Now, where is the five number summary on this plot? Observation 40 at the very top here, this is the maximum. Okay, so the highest value, 100% on our summary, that is this value here. Okay, so this is the max. Now at the bottom, you see that there are no dots sitting outside the whisker. So the whisker is the minimum. So this value right here, this whisker bar, this is the 0%, which is 9,496.9. 0.6. So the whisker here is 9,496.6. The largest value here, 40, 
is the 100% marker, the maximum, 20,748. The other three values in the data set are Q1, or sorry, the other three values on the box plot that are a part of the five number summary are Q1, Q2, and Q3. So the 25th percentile, the 50th percentile, and the 75th percentile. Or the first quartile, the second quartile, aka the median, and the third quartile. Those are represented in the box. So this first, this lowest um, edge of the box, this is the first quartile. Okay, so the lower edge is the 25th percent marker, which is 9,930.4. Okay, so that's right here. The thick black line inside the box is the median or Q2 or the 50th percentile, which is 10,483.25. The upper edge of the box is the third quartile, which is 12,750.7. Okay. So our five number summary is minimum, Q1, median, Q3, maximum. The box plot shows for this data set, the minimum as this lower whisker. We know this is the minimum because there's no points below the whisker. Q1, lower edge of the box, that's always the same. Q2, the median inside the box, always going to be that way. Q3, the um, third quartile is the upper edge of the box, consistent. And then what we have in this particular case is the maximum as this observation 40. And now this whisker here represents what is called the upper limit. Okay, so when we constructed the box plot, <clears throat> we checked off automatically detect outliers. The way a box plot detects outliers is to construct an upper limit and a lower limit, and then, de and then determine if any values in the data set sit outside these limits. This bar, this upper whisker here that my mouse is scrolling on top of, this is constructed using the formula Q3 plus 1.5 multiplied by the IQR. Okay, so in R, if we wanted to manually compute this, we would take Q3, which is 12,750.7, and then we would add 1.5 multiplied by the IQR, which is 2,820.3. Okay, and then we would submit this. And we have 16,981.15. Okay. So this whisker right here is the value 16,981.15. And the reason that the box plot shows this is because there are five, six observations, 32, 34, 40, 45, 80, and 84, that are bigger in area than this upper limit. So they are defined as outlying or extreme observations. All right, that's quite a bit. Questions? And then again, just as a reminder, all this stuff you'll see in lecture two. So construction of box plot by hand and all this sort of thing, we'll talk about in lecture as well. Um, Rebecca, where do those numbers come from? The 32, 34, 40. Yeah, so again, when we build a box plot, we construct two limits, an upper limit and a lower limit. The upper limit is Q3 plus 1.5 times the IQR. For this data set, Q3 plus 1.5 times the IQR is 16,981.15. The observations 32, 34, 40, 45, 80, and 84 
are observations that exceed this number. So for example, if we look at 32, which is right here in the data set, that's 17,492. That's bigger than the upper limit, so it gets marked as an outlier. 34 is the same thing. 18,238.2 is bigger than the upper limit. It gets marked as an outlier. And that's the same idea for the other four. Yeah, cool. Taylor, standard deviation. Sorry, what's the, can you clarify the question, please? Oh, are you asking what does the top tail represent standard deviation? So this here, this thing that I'm scrolling over, that is the upper limit. So that is the Q3 plus 1.5 times IQR. Does that make sense? No. So the standard deviation and the mean are not a part of a box plot. It's only the five number summary. The upper and lower limits are used to check for outliers. So every time we build a box plot, we always compute the upper and lower limit. And then we check to see if any value is lower than the lower limit or bigger than the upper limit. And if there are, they are called outliers and they are marked as individual points, like you can see here on the graph. Does that make sense? Okay. Okay, so actually that's, those are the only three things we need to talk about today. Now, there's a few other things though that we should go over. First off, what does a box plot show us outside of just outlying points? So here we can clearly see in this illustration that we have outliers, okay? So 32, 34, 40, 45, 80, and 84, those are considered outlying points. This box plot also shows us skewness. Why does it show us skewness? Well, you can see that the lower half of the box plot, so the minimum, the lower tail here, the median and Q1 are very close together. And then we have a much larger deviation between Q3 in the median and the upper tail and the maximum in the median. So this is showing us a bigger range of values from the maximum to the median and a much smaller range of values from the median to the lower tail. That is right skewness. Now, what would symmetry look like in a box plot? Symmetry would be represented by evenly spaced, um, um, evenly spaced horizontal lines. So I'll show you an example of symmetry, okay? Symmetry would be a bell curve shaped graph, yeah. Okay, so this is a symmetrical box plot. Yes, Taylor, that is correct. A bell curve shaped histogram would cause a symmetrical box plot, yeah. Is that what you're asking? Cool, yeah, you got it. Okay, so this here, is a symmetrical box plot. For clarity, this would be the associated histogram, which is what Taylor was asking about. Okay, you can see here we have that bell curve symmetric shape in the histogram. The corresponding box plot looks like this. So you can see that there's an equal spacing between each of the horizontal lines on this plot. We have the median at zero, then we have the standard deviate, or we have Q1 and Q3, both roughly like 
0.75 away, but the box is evenly shaped. It's symmetric. The median sits right in the middle of the box. When we look at the two whiskers, those horizontal lines, those are an even distance from the box as well. And then when we look at the outlying points, those are also an even distance from the median or from the box. So symmetry is represented through equally spaced values. Right skewness is represented by the lower half being really close together and the upper half being really far apart. So something like this. Okay, so here's the histogram, clearly very right skewed. And then the corresponding box plot is gonna look something like this. So you can see the lower half is all kind of crunched together and then the upper half is really spread out. That would be right skewness. Left skewness would be the opposite idea. Um, I just need to think of, so left skewness we could do like this, I think. Yeah, so left skewness would look something like this. The top half really smushed together and then the lower half really far apart. So the box plots, they tell us which points are outlying or how many outliers there are. It tells us if the outliers are on the lower half or the upper half. And then what it does is it tells us the shape, symmetric versus right or left skew. What a box plot does not tell us is modality, okay? Modality can only be found through a histogram. Um, okay, let's um, do another example of checking for outliers with a different variable. So let's use, um, I don't know, let's do price, why not? Okay, so if we go statistics, summaries, numerical summaries, and then we click on price and okay, we get our numerical summary below. Okay, now let's suppose, so I wanna check for outlying points. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna click, I'm gonna build my lower limit, which is going to be um, Q3, or lower limit, sorry. My lower limit is gonna be Q1, which is 13,100, or sorry, 131,425 minus 1.5 times the IQR, which is 59,825. Then I'm gonna build my upper limit, which is 191,250 plus, 1.5 times the IQR, which is 59825. Okay, and I'm gonna call this lower limit, and I'm gonna call this upper limit. All right, so my lower limit and my upper limit are 41,687.5 and 280,980.5. So if in the price category, any single value is less than 41,685 or $87.5, it's a lower half outlier. If any value is bigger than 280,987.5, it is an upper half outlier. So if we construct the box plot for price, you can see that the box plot is demonstrating that we have no value less than 41,687.5, and we have no value greater than 280,987.5. So there are no outliers in this data set. Now, when there are no outliers in a data set, the lower um, whisker 
and the upper whisker become the minimum and the maximum. So in this box plot, the lower whisker is the minimum, which is 105,000. The upper whisker is the maximum, which is 262,500. 262, and then Q1, Q2, and Q3, the box values are as they were before. So from box plot to box plot, what, will, what can change is whether or not outliers are detected. If there are outliers, the limits, the horizontal whiskers, they default to the upper and lower val limit values that we just calculated. And if there are no outliers, then these whiskers are the minimum and the maximum values in the data set. Any questions? An outlier is considered a point that is um, far away from the other values in the data set. So we would consider an outlier to be a point that almost seems as if it was unrelated to the rest of the value, something that kind of deviates from the pack, if you will. Okay, so um, with the rest of the time, so we still have about 35 minutes left. We can use this time to start working on the second assignment, in particular, the lab portion for the second assignment. So I'm gonna stay in the chat. I'm gonna stop recording because I don't have anything else that I need to teach per se, but if you have questions, I'm gonna stay on and we can use this as kind of a, an office hour slash working period to try and knock off questions from the assignment. And this is typically how the labs are going to work. I'll give you kind of a half of the class I'll spend introducing it and going over the terms and showing you how to calculate things. And then we have the rest of the time to try and em employ these things ourselves. The recorded lectures are on YouTube. I've been sending out emails um, with the links. I will, uh, I'll post it. I'll post the last one in, um, in the chat. Okay, so I'm going to stop recording now, but I'm not logging off.